be here tonight. And uh, what I want to do is to speak a little bit about my book and the themes of the book, uh, and then open it also to a little bit of a Q&A. Uh, unfortunately, the topics of the books are not as uh, happy and light as this wonderful kind of event uh, among all these friends and colleagues. There are lots of many serious problems out there. That's why I've written this book. Uh, the book is titled, uh, you know, Mega Threats. And the subtitle is uh, 10 Dangerous Trend, Trends That Imperil Our Future and How to Survive Them. Uh, you know, I'm an economist, and usually economists believe in the concept of uh, comparative advantage, meaning stick to what you know best and don't talk about things that you don't know best. And usually I write about uh, economic, monetary, and financial issues and risks and threats. My previous book was uh, on the global financial crisis and on um, financial crisis in general, titled Crisis Economics. This is a book that is not just about economic, monetary, and financial threats, but also about social, uh, political, uh, geopolitical, environmental, health, technological risk coming from, for example, from AI, robotic, and automation, risk of deglobalization, and of course, a risk of economic and financial crisis. It's a bit of like a 10 by 10 matrix in which each one of these factors affects the other one and it's affected back. And I had to learn a lot of stuff I didn't know about. I'm not an expert about science and technology. I'm not an expert of geopolitics or law. I'm not an expert of politics. But we live in a world in which all of these things are interconnected and therefore thinking only in terms of economic terms or only political terms uh, doesn't make sense. So it's a bit ambitious because dealing with stuff that I, is not my specialty, I try to take an angle of understanding each one of these threats and the economic and financial kind of implications. Now people ask me why, why I wrote this book and what, uh, what inspired it. You know, I, I have gray hair, I'm older than many of you, I'm 64. I was born in 1958 in Istanbul and then we moved from there to Tehran, then to Israel, and then to Italy. And I grew up uh, between Middle East and then uh, Europe from 58 until 1983 when I came uh, to the United States uh, for my graduate studies. And when I was growing up, there were things that are threats today that were not even on my mind. And not just on my mind, but on the mind of most people in the period after World War II until the middle of the 1980s. For example, uh, I never, while growing up, thought about a war between great powers or the risk of a nuclear war. Because in the 70s, there was this detente between the US and the Soviet Union. Nixon went to China. And the risk of a war between the US on one side and the Soviet Union or China, that was already low before, became close to zero. Yeah, there were geopolitical rivalries. There were proxy wars in Afghanistan, Angola, Mozambique, but no US soldier killed a Russian or a Chinese and vice versa. So it was not even on people's mind and radar screen. I never heard when I was growing up about climate change. It was not, not something that people worried about in the 60s and the 70s. There was this club of Rome that worried about the limits to growth. They were gonna run out of natural resources because of growth of population, but it was more of a Malthusian argument of limits of growth. It was not an issue about environmental kind of catastrophe. So that was not something that people worried about. Uh, growing up, I had never heard about uh, the term of global pandemics. You know, the last one had been in 1918, after World War I, the Spanish flu. But we did not have any of them until the early 80s, when we started having HIV, SARS, MERS, and so on. So again, that was not a concept that was even in anybody's mind. I've never heard about the risk that artificial intelligence or machine learning or robotic or automation will destroy most jobs, and not just routine jobs, but even creative jobs. At that time, people talked about the AI winter. There was theoretical work on AI, but no application. So the idea that robots would replace human beings or jobs was just uh, not uh, on anybody's mind. I've never heard that while growing up about the risk of uh, protectionism, of deglobalization, of trade or currency wars, because there was a process of opening of trade. There was the GATT, then the WTO, various rounds of uh, liberalization of trade with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the opening of China, 
China, Russia, India, most emerging market reached and joined the global labor supply and the global trading system. And we had actually hyper-globalization as opposed to deglobalization. At that time, I'd never heard about the risk of uh, debt and financial crisis because the ratios of private and public debt were very low and there was strong economic growth. So that ratio was sustainable. I grew up in Italy where people were worrying about budget deficits, but compared to the deficit we have today, those deficits look like ridiculous. And in the private sector, people were saving a lot. So there was not much private debt. I'd never heard about the idea of uh, implicit uh, debt or unfunded liability coming from aging, social security system or healthcare system that are pay as you go. Because there were lots of young people, growth of labor supply, lots of workers, and the number of retiree was still very low. So the risk of not being able to pay for social security benefit or Medicare uh, did not really exist at that time. We had even strong migration that increased the labor supply to Europe, to the United States. I, I, when I was thinking about economic cycles, yeah, once upon a while there was a recession, but the recession was relatively mild and short and shallow. In the 70s it was a little more problematic because we had the stagflation of the oil shock of 73 and 79, but by 1982, 1982 inflation was back to 5% with the great moderation, we had falling inflation, rising economic growth, rising equity markets, and everything was fine. We had 15 years of actually excellent economic growth. I never heard at that time about severe financial crisis because there was a regulation of banks and the financial system, supervision, there were capital controls, so this kind of boom bubbles, bust and crash that we've seen in the last 20 years did not exist. It took until the 1980s when you had the Latin American debt crisis in 1982. But that was the first case of something very, very kind of severe. And finally, I used to live in Italy that was like most advanced economies, a liberal democracy. Of course, there was center right, there was center left. In the US, you had Republicans, you had Democrats. In UK, you had Tories and Labour. Yeah, there were differences between center right and center left, but there was not that kind of, how to say, radical political polarization, division, partisanship that we see that is really nasty today, not just in the United States, but also in many other parts of the world. So this is the world in which I, I grew up. If I fast forward to today, and I'm thinking about what's going on in the world today, it's a very different world because you had four decades between the end of World War II and the mid 80s where things were relatively stable. You had about 40 years of relative peace, prosperity, and progress. Not that there were not divisions, not that there were not issues, there were pl plenty of problems in the world, but compared to the world of today, it looked like more stable. If I look at the world today instead, uh, what I see, and that's why I'm writing about mega threats. Uh, first of all, I see what I call a geopolitical depression. There is a significant rivalry between, on one side, the US, Europe, and the West, and a number of countries that have a very different economic, political, and geopolitical view of the world. Uh, they refer to as revisionist powers, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, increasingly Pakistan. These are countries that without making a value judgment do not accept anymore the economic, political and geopolitical order that the US and the West created after World War II. China is rising, they say, we want to be uh, important hegemonic, for example, in Asia. We don't accept the fact that US is the hegemonic power in Asia. And unfortunately, there is the beginning of what people are referring as a new Cold War. The new Cold War started with uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this brutal invasion. And unfortunately, this particular conflict could, I'm not saying it will, but could escalate in the next few months in two dangerous ways. One, Russia using uh, unconventional weapons like tactical nuclear weapons to try to stop the advance of the Ukrainian troops, they just decided today to leave Kherson. There's a key loss for the Russians. People say they might use one of those tactical nuclear weapons. And if that happens, there is a risk that US and NATO is gonna be involved because the US is gonna to react to an action like this by attacking Russia. So there's a risk. I'm not saying the probability is high, 
Some people think it's high, that this becomes a nuclear war and an unconventional war that leads to a conflict between directly NATO and Russia. You know, I go often to Israel where my parents and relatives live. Uh, Iran is on a collision course with Israel and the United States. Uh, they look, they want to go nuclear. They believe that having a bomb is gonna prevent regime change that they think that the West wants to impose on them. And Israel, for Israel, in Iran with the bomb is an existential threat. So the risk that eventually Israel and all the US is gonna attack uh, Iran is a serious one with potential of escalating conflict throughout the Middle East. In the 70s, those uh, geopolitical shock, the Yom Kippur War between Israel and the Arab states in 1973, and the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, led, as you know, to a tripling <coughs> of oil prices, inflation, recession, stagflation for a decade. This time around, the shock will be much bigger. And uh, if you look at the relationship between US and China, I used to go to China at least four times a year before COVID. Since COVID is very hard to get in, it was the last week in, in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, there's a beginning of a cold war between US and China. And this cold war is becoming colder and people are starting to worry that eventually there might be even a hot war. We have now a decoupling between US and China in trade in goods, in services, in the movements of investments and capital, movements of people and labor, and of course, technology, data, and information. And this conflict is escalating literally uh, by the day. There's this famous book by Graham Allison from Harvard. It's called, uh, Will uh, US and China Avoid the Thucydides Trap? The Thucydides Trap, as you might know, is the story wrote, written by Thucydides, the great historian of Greek history of the rise of power of Athens facing an existing power, Sparta, and that led to war. And for the last 500 years, every time you had a rising new power facing an existing one, in 12 out of 16 cases, you have not only a cold war, but you had eventually a hot war. Exceptions being uh, the transfer of power from the British Empire to the US Empire, but we had the same language, culture, political system, economic system. And of course, there was the rivalry between US and the Soviet Union that did not lead to a hot war, only because the Soviet Union imploded because of its own economic failings. You can say anything about China, but China is not going to implode. It may have problems, but it's a rising power. So there is that this conflict eventually from a Cold War becomes something more severe, is a severe one. Uh, on the issue, for example, of Taiwan. Just last week, the head of the US Navy made a statement on the front page of the Financial <coughs> Times saying that the US now believes that China might try to invade Taiwan before 2024. People are saying five years from now, 10 years from now. It could happen in the next 12 months for a number of reasons. And Xi Jinping just came to power for the third time, not because he wants to reform China, but he wants to pass to history as the man that united the mainland with Taiwan. And by the way, mark this particular date, October 7, 2022. This could be the beginning of what people are gonna remember in history as the beginning of potentially World War III. Because on October 7 of this year, just a month ago, the US decided to impose super draconian restrictions to exports of advanced semiconductors from the US. Semiconductor, semiconductor equipment, and no US can work for a Chinese firm in that industry for things that developed AI, machine learning, quantum computing because there is this rivalry. And this is a declaration of economic and technological war. Maybe necessary, because whoever is gonna control AI, machine learning, and quantum is not only gonna dominate the industries of the future, but it's gonna become also the hegemonic power from a military, security, and geopolitical point of view. That's why this year, Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google, and Henry Kissinger, the greatest strategist in US, geopolitically, who did the opening to China, have written a book about the threat that in the rivalry between US and China on AI, if China takes over AI, it's gonna take over the world, not just the world economy. So this decision by the US is the declaration literally of economic and technological war. Maybe necessary, because if we're not gonna contain the use of these technologies by China, China might dominate the world, but from the Chinese point of view, that's a 
strategy not of competition, but of really trying to contain them, the same way we're trying to contain the Soviet Union. I'll give you the following example. <clears throat> During World War II, before Pearl Harbor, the US decided to restrict the exports of what? Scrap metal and some oil to Japan. And Japan saw, saw this one as such a threat to their own economic stability that they decided to strike at Pearl Harbor. The Chinese are gonna think carefully about what they need to do, but the point is this cold war is becoming colder by the day and eventually a hot war can occur. And now people in, in Washington are saying it could occur as early as 2024. And that's not gonna be a conventional war. It's gonna fast enough end up into an unconventional one. How likely or not, we don't know. But already now, this geopolitical depression, division between revisionist powers and the West is leading to a decoupling, to a fragmentation of the global economy, to a balkanization of global supply chains, to divisions, to friendshoring rather than offshoring, to talk about secure trade rather than uh, free trade, and it's gonna divide the world. Divide the world economically, trade-wise, financially, technologically, in completely different systems. They're gonna be divided. It's gonna have significant economic costs because instead of producing where it's cheapest, we'll have to produce where it's safest. And that's gonna have severe economic and financial consequences for the world. So this is one of the kind of things that we have to start to worry about today. And uh, I was surprised actually the press did not report seriously about this decision on October 7 because it's gonna to pass to history as something that I remember as a declaration of real economic and technological war. We live also in a world in which right now we are on the verge, is a slow motion train wreck of an environmental apocalypse. I have a whole chapter in the book about the environment. And of course, tons of books have been written about the environment. The trouble with the environment and climate change right now, everybody's in Sharma Sheikh for the new COP, is there is unfortunately too much talk and not enough action. Given even the promises at Glasgow that are not gonna be maintained, we are on the way to achieving two plus, 2.5 plus increase in temperature compared to pre-industrial level. 1.5 is bad, two is a disaster, 2.5 is a real disaster. And actually, most people believe we're gonna to go to plus three. They're gonna imply total economic destruction for the world. Unfortunately, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of green washing, there's a lot of green wishing, there's a lot of green fig leaves. Every government, every corporation says, I'm caring, I want to reach net zero. There's a lot of talk just to show that you're doing something. And there is not really much change. Just as this past year, you had massive droughts in Pakistan, in India, throughout Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in the US, there's a drought now for decades that goes from Colorado all the way to California. As you know, Lake Mead and Lake Powell, they have so little water that the uh, corpses of mobsters from Las Vegas are coming to the surface, <laughs> literally, every day, uh, because there is no water, so everything is coming to the surface. One third of all vegetables in the US, two thirds of all fruits and nuts are produced in California. The farmers today in California find it better to sell their water rights to some industry rather than growing crops. That's why even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was a spike in food prices. Because when you have desertification, you have lack of water, there is a collapse of agriculture, the cost of producing food goes up, and this is gonna get worse year after year, decade after decade, even if there was no war between Russia and Ukraine. That's one of the consequences of this environmental disaster. So lots of ESG investment, with due respect to those who do it, is lots of talk and face saving. And not only with greenwashing and green wishing, we also have a green inflation. Because of the increase in the cost of energy, the cost of producing green metals, things like lithium, cobalt, and other things that are useful to create, say, batteries for electric vehicles, going through the roof. So we have green inflation inflation for production of things that are actually gonna be environmentally good. Unfortunately, I could speak for hours about the environment, we're doing very little, and it's a slow motion train wreck that's becoming much worse. 
There are scenarios in which one third of the United States in the next 20 years is not going to be livable. The coastlines flooded to sea rise levels and hurricanes are becoming more frequent and more virulent. You have the South is becoming like an oven. It's going to become too hot to live. You have the drought from Colorado, California, and therefore you have massive wildfires that are destroying more and more stuff. And the Mississippi River Valley is flooded over and over again. And when it's not flooded, there's not enough water and you cannot use it for transportation. Same thing in Europe, in Germany, and so on. So this is happening in the United States, let alone in other parts of the world. There are scenarios in which you're going to have half of the world not being able to live, and you'll have billions of people left to move. Billions of refugee, climate refugees. We are worried about a few hundred thousand people coming from Mexico or Central America. Wait, there will be tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people wanted to come to the Midwest, into Canada, and so on. What's going to happen when that happens? We are on a track to getting in that place. We're now facing also the prospects of pandemics and plagues that are worse than the ones uh, in the Bible. You know, in the Bible there was the 10 plagues of Egypt, like the 10 mega threats. Maybe there's a reference between <laughs> one and the other. There were also the 10 commandments as well. Uh, but uh, interesting point, there's a strong correlation, I link different types of threats between climate change and the pandemics. Because think of it this way, between 1918 and 1980, we didn't almost have any pandemic. You had the Spanish flu that was a small one in 1957. But now, since 1980, we've had HIV, SARS, MERS, uh, uh, swine flu, bird flu, Zika, Ebola, COVID-19, monkeypox. And it's only a matter of time where there's gonna be COVID-23 or 24 or another freaky one. What's the correlation? Why suddenly in the 1980s, after 60 years of none? When you destroy the animal ecosystems because of urbanization and environmental destruction, those animals that carry pathogens, like the pangolins, the bats, and others, come closer and closer in contact with livestock animals and human beings. And therefore, they're called zoonotic diseases because they transfer from animal to human, and the probability of happening becomes more frequent because we are in touch with all these animals as we destroy their ecosystems. That's why these things are becoming more frequent. And by the way, climate change implies that the tar tundra, the permafrost in Siberia is gonna melt and is already melting. And under it, there is methane is gonna be released in the atmosphere. And methane has 10 times more greenhouse gas emission than CO2. So it's gonna be a total disaster. And scientists are saying that under the tundra, frozen, there are viruses and bacteria that have been frozen for thousands of years. And when they're gonna defrost, you'll have really freaky stuff happening, much worse than COVID. And actually they found some of these viruses last week somewhere in Siberia. So this is just uh, serious science and so on. So luckily we have technologies maybe to try to find vaccines and we were lucky enough to find a vaccine for COVID-19 in 12 months but we're gonna have hundreds of them coming out and more frequent and more virulent is not always we're gonna be able to deal with these types of pandemic. They'll become more severe, more frequent, more virulent. Additional point, today for the first time since the 1970s, we have to worry about inflation. Uh, again, most people who are young, you tell them inflation, they say, what is it? You know, we had less than 2% inflation for the last 20 years. When you tell them about stagflation, they scratch their heads, what's stagflation? Uh, usually, you don't have high inflation and a recession, because if you have high inflation, it's because there is too much economic growth and overeating, but having high inflation and recession doesn't make sense, unless you remember that when there are negative aggregate supply shocks that reduce output and increase the cost of production, you can have recession and inflation at the same time, like it happened in 1973 and 79. I'm not going to go over all the de debates today on why we are having a rise in inflation and we're going to go into a recession and we're going to have a recession in advanced economies. In my view, it's not going to be short and shallow. It's going to be severe, protracted, and virulent for reasons we can discuss at length. But in the book, I point out that the negative supply shocks that are leading to inflation are not only short-term. 
It's not just the impact of COVID initially on the supply of labor, of goods and services, or the reduction in the number of workers available because of the great resignation. It's not only because Russia invaded Ukraine and now you're a spike in oil prices, natural gas, fertilizer, food, industrial metals. And it's not only the fact that you have a this zero COVID policy of China, and I was just in Hong Kong where it's not as bad as China, but definitely you get tested uh, every other hour and you have restriction on where you went, can go and so on. Those are the short term negative supply shock that increase cost of production and we lose monetary and fiscal policy that have led now to inflation. In the book I discuss 11 factors that are more medium term, that reduce potential growth, increase the cost of production, and we've lost monetary and fiscal policy that lead to inflation, to recession, and therefore stagflation. Stagflation is going to be worse than the one of the 1970s. I don't have time to discuss them right now, but uh, they're all in chapter five of the book. At the same time, however, uh, not only we're going to have stagflation, but in the first two chapters I talk about the mother of all debt crisis, that we're going to have massive insolvencies and mat massive debt crisis. Why do I worry about that? If you look at uh, the amounts of private and public debt, private debt is the debt of households, mortgages, credit cards, auto loans, student loans, and so on, and um, of the private sector, corporate financial institution, public is of course government. The ratio of private and public debt as a share of GDP in 1970 was about 100% of GDP, very low. But the year 2000 was 200% of GDP. Last year was 350% of GDP and rising sharply. In advanced economies already 420% of GDP and rising. In China is 330% of GDP and rising. In the US, the ratio of private and public debt today is higher than the peak of the Great Depression and the peak that it occurred after World War II, where we had huge deficits. And today we're not coming out of a Great Depression, we're not coming out, out of a major war, but we still have debt ratio like we've never seen historically. Now there's a long discussion in the book on how loose monetary policy and backstopping and bailing out and cheap money <coughs> has led to a build up of debt year after year, decade after decade. Until now we're lucky because the debt ratios are very high, yet zombie household, zombie corporates, zombie businesses, zombie financial institutions, zombie governments, zombie countries. But because we had low interest rates, while debt ratio were low, high debt servicing ratio were low. You had uh, zero policy rates for many years. You had negative policy rates. You had quantitative easing and credit easing that kept long-term interest rates low. And during the last two crises, the global financial crisis and the COVID crisis, when we entered the shock and the recession, we had the risk of deflation, not of inflation, because it was a demand shock. And therefore we could do massive monetary and fiscal and credit easing, because we are trying to fight deflation. This time around, we have the worst of the 1970s and the worst of the period after the GFC. Because in the 1970s, there were negative supply shocks that led to inflation, recession, stagflation, but debt ratios were low. And therefore, we did not have a debt crisis in Europe and the United States. After the global financial crisis, we had the debt crisis, housing debt, mortgage debt, bank risk-taking and leverage, but because it was a demand shock and a credit crunch, we had deflation and we could do massive easing. Today, instead, we have a stagflationary shock that causing inflation and recession at the time where debt ratios are historically high. So we are entering a recession, not by cutting interest rates, but we have to raise them to fight inflation. And as you raise interest rates, not only you're going to cause a hard landing, recession, rising unemployment, but you're going to increase debt servicing ratio so that all institutions that were insolvent, the zombies, are going to go bankrupt. And if they go bankrupt, that financial shocks makes the recession worse. And as the recession comes worse, the financial condition, the distress is going to become worse in a vicious cycle. So we have the worst of the 70s and the worst of the post-GFC period. So not only we're going to have inflation, not only we're going to have recession, 
not only we're gonna have stagflation, but we're gonna have the great stagflationary debt crisis, the combination of stagflation and the mother of all debt crisis. And this is the explicit debt. Today, because of aging of population and unfunded social security and Medicare and so on, all over the world in advanced economies, the amount of this implicit debt as a share of GDP is as high as the explicit debt. The average for advanced economies is 100% of GDP. Another time bomb that is not resolvable. So you have explicit government debt and then you have implicit liabilities. And this aging problem for the last 20 years was partly resolved by allowing migration to US, to Europe, from south to north, from poor to rich. But now because of economic, social, and political constraints, we're restricting migration. I would say the migration policy of the Biden administration are really no different than those of Trump. And if we're worried about a few hundred thousand desperate people, and they're desperate because there are climate refugees, they're coming from failed states, there's crime, there is violence, there is economic insecurity all over Central America and Latin America. They're coming here to have a better life. And we're saying, sorry, you cannot get in. Right now, there are a few hundred thousand. Because of climate change, most of Central America is becoming a desert. Guatemala, you cannot produce anything. These people are desperately from their farms are going to the cities, there are in the shanty towns, there is poverty, there is crime, and they try to desperately come to the United States. Yes. They're not gonna be a few hundred thousand, they're not gonna be millions, they're gonna be dozens of millions, and we're gonna say no to them. Yes. That's what's happening. And that's, and in the past, migration was helping us with aging, and with increasing growth. Now we're saying, sorry, the doors are closed. So that's what's, what's happening. At the same time, uh, as I said, uh, we'll have more severe economic and financial crisis. These cycles of boom, bubble, bust, and crash are becoming more severe, more virulent, in part because we have policies that don't prick the bubbles on the way up, and when the bubble crashes, we bail out everybody with easy money, easy credit, easy fiscal. So this boom and bust is becoming more severe. And look at this year. The Fed barely started to raise rates this year from zero to what? Closer to three and a half. And now, stock market S&P down 20%. NASDAQ down 25%. The bubble in growth, VC, tech, down 30, 40%. Private equity, sharply down. The bubble in MIMI stocks, in SPACs, in crypto, totally bursting. The bubble in credit, bursting. Even real estate now is starting to have a downturn. And in the past, when equities go down, bond yields go down, and the price of bond goes up. So you lose money on equity, but you make money on your bond portfolio, in a 60, 40 portfolio of equity and bonds. This year, for the first time in decades, you lost more money on your bonds, safe bonds of the government, than you lost on equities. Because 10-year treasury yields went from 1% to 4%, therefore the price has fallen of long duration bonds by 25%. So you lost 20% on S&P, 25% on your bonds. You lost money on everything, there was nowhere to hide. Usually the price of one goes up, the price of the other goes down, bonds and equities, negatively correlated. Now they're positively, because when inflation goes higher, equities go down, bond yields go higher and the price falls. So you lost money on bonds, on equities, on other risky assets, and you lost money even on cash because inflation wipes out the real value of cash. So there was nowhere to hide unless you go to alternative types of investment that I'm thinking about with some of my colleagues. So we're having the basement of fiat currencies, the risk of even de-dollarization because of geopolitics, financial strains of one sort or another. Financial crises are going to become more intense and more severe. Now, the topic of AI, of course, is medium long term. But what's happening right now is that uh, usually AI, machine learning, robotic, and automation was going to destroy mostly blue collar jobs, things that are routine, right? The factory jobs that the machine can do. However, for the last few decades, we've realized that even many white collar jobs that are more cognitive can be sliced in various steps that are various tasks. And each one of these tasks can be automated. And therefore, it's not just blue collar jobs, but now white collar jobs, they're gonna be replaced by automation. 
Unfortunately, even creative jobs today eventually may be replaced by AI. There are AIs that create pieces of music. It's only a matter of time where that song created by purely AI is gonna be top 10 in the hit list of Billboard magazine. You can do paintings, you can write scripts, you can write pieces of journalism. I'm an economist. My day job is actually to predict what the Fed, the ECB, or the Bank of England is gonna do. I do it today better than most people because I've done it for 30 years. But mind my words, 10 years from now, there'll be an AI that looks at every economic data, every speech of every Fed governor, every reaction function of every central bank, and it's gonna predict better than me what's gonna be the next decision of the Fed on interest rates and on economic activity and so on. Same thing for any other central bank. 10 years from now, I will be obsolete, okay? So that's gonna to happen to somebody who has a creative job. That's the process we're going to. And the solution to these problems are not easy. And as I pointed out, who's gonna control AI is gonna dominate not only the global economy, but also geopolitical. And the question is, do we want a country like China? And I have great respect for Chinese, and I have many Chinese friends, but their political system is authoritarian, and becoming more authoritarian. Their economic system is one of uh, state capitalism, becoming even more capitalist. And their foreign policy, under Deng Xiaoping and then Jiang Zemin and President Hu was hide your strength and bide your time. Maximize economic growth. Don't worry about flexing your muscles. But Xi Jinping is saying China has risen. Uh, we have to also have interests that are foreign policy and security in our own region. We are not comfortable with the US Navy being 50 miles away from our shores day in, day out. I mean, if there was a Chinese Navy next to New York or San Francisco, aircraft carrier systems would be bothered. What the Chinese say, why the US is there. And they say, we're rising, and therefore we have to project our power. And from their point of view, not for aggressive reasons, but purely defensive, like defending commercial lanes for transportation and shipping. So what we see as aggressive, they see it as defensive. But they're flexing their muscles, so their economic system, their political system, their geopolitical stance is uh, clashing with ours. And it's a clash where the wars of the future are gonna be based on drones, on autonomous weapons, on autonomous robots, fighting ones and so on. That's why controlling those technology is not just economic power, but it's also geopolitical power. So the dark side of AI is that the economic pie is gonna increase but the inequality is gonna be also increasing. We've had a massive increase in inequality, income and wealth all over the world. Not just in advanced economies, within China, within India, within emerging markets. The division between rich and poor are becoming bigger rather than smaller. Why? Many reasons, but one of them is that technological innovation is capital intensive, skill buyers, and labor saving. So if you own the machines or the capital and financial capital owns the machine, you do well. If you're in the top 10% of the distribution of education, skills, human capital, like almost everybody here, AI initially is gonna make you more productive, more efficient. But if you are a blue collar worker or a white collar worker, low value added or middle value added, your job and your income is gonna be gradually increasingly destroyed by AI. And that's the dark side of AI, unless we have then universal basic income and taxing the winners and transferring income to those who are left behind. But this is gonna be politically acceptable. People want the dignity of work and jobs, of being productive members of society, not to be given a welfare check. So it's gonna be socially and politically sustainable doing something like that. And the other dark side of technology is the following one. We think of technology innovation as increasing the economic pie, but most technological innovation actually occur because there is a power that's trying to have a fight with a rival. And if you have bigger and stronger and more advanced weapons, you win that war. You know, during World War II, we had initially nuclear weapons and eventually we had civilian application like nuclear power. The period between 1870 and 1914 was the golden area first of globalization and of technological innovation. And in spite of that, we built the weapons that led to World War I. And then during the roaring 20s, before the stock market crash, we had technological innovation that led to the buildup of the bombs 
and the weapons and the fighter planes and eventually of nuclear weapons that led us to fight World War II. And today, the fight about AI is not just about machine learning or electric vehicles or autonomous vehicles or biotech. It's also who's going to have the weapon to dominate the world, whether it's going to be China or whether it's going to be the United States. Cyber weapons, autonomous weapons, and so on and so on. So unfortunately, unfortunately, weapons are often used initially to fight wars. And those technology innovations are for bigger and nastier weapons. And eventually you have the civilian application after you've done the destruction of war. So this is the kind of uh, world in which uh, we live in. And because of this, there's now a nasty backlash against uh, liberal democracy all over the world. Uh, you have, uh, in Russia, you have Putin. You have Erdogan in Turkey. You have Orban in Hungary. You have Kaczynski in Poland. You have these neo-fascists of Meloni in Italy. You have these Swedish Democrats in Sweden that are now neo-Nazis just came to power, part of the coalition there. You had the Trump phenomenon. You had the Brexit phenomenon, if you're thinking about populism of extreme right. And on the left, take Latin America. There used to be only a couple of populists of the left, Argentina and Venezuela. But look at the last two years. In Peru, in Chile, in Colombia, in Mexico, just last week, uh, uh, Lula in uh, Brazil, you had populists of the left how extreme they are to be this scene, but the populists of the left coming to power. And in Brazil, the choice was between a fascist like Bolsonaro, extremist populist a la Trump of the right, and a populist of the left. Hopefully, Lula is gonna be like Lula one rather than Lula two, but we don't know. So whether it's extremist of extreme left or extreme right, the center is not holding. There is more polarization, there is more divisions, there is more partisanship all over the world. People are already writing today entire books in the US about the risk of violence, of civil war, insurrection, secession in 2024. If Trump runs, he loses and he claims that the election was stolen and he tells the guys, the Proud Boys, don't stand by but start doing something like you did on January 6th. This thing could happen again. Hopefully it's not gonna happen again. We're reaching a point in which a democracy like the United States is at risk of actually becoming an illiberal democracy and violence in the US happening as well. Now, it looks like a depressing picture. In the book, uh, okay. Okay, this, this is the bad news. Okay. Uh, the, the good news, let me see how long I've spoken. Okay, uh, I should stop. The, the bad news is that we have this problem the good news is that for each chapter, I propose the solutions to these problems. And then there are two chapters, 11 and 12. One is a dystopian future, where all these threats feed on each other, they materialize, and then it's not just the end of the world economy and financial market, it's the destruction of our planet, it's the nuclear winter, it's a disaster, where our own species eventually, with super intelligence, becomes even obsolete. And Homo sapiens is replaced by, God knows, Homo or Femina Deus, if you believe in Yuval Harari. There is an alternative solution and scenario where slowly, slowly, we take action to resolve each one of these problems and we have a better future. Maybe it's not utopian, but it's not dystopian. It's not going to be a happy future, but it's not going to be one in which we have a total economic, financial, military disaster, chaos, instability, and war. And of course, it's up to each of us individually our own decision, not just individually, collectively, to work towards a better planet where we take care of conflict, domestic and external, climate change, diseases, where we try not only to do well, but do good. Because if we don't do it, we're in this boat together. Either we swim and survive together, or we're gonna sink together. So there could be light at the end of the tunnel, but I think that while the book might look depressing, the objective of the book is not to scare people, but to be warning people about the threats we're facing. As I said, when I was growing up, these threats, all 10 of them, were not even in the back of anybody's mind. While today, you may agree or disagree with me on how severe they are, but everybody I've spoken for the last few weeks has told me, listen, you're not alarmist, you're not trying to scare people. Each one of these threats is a material risk and threat. 
than how severe they are, whether are slow motion or fast motion, and how they will interact with each other, we can agree what are the potential solutions or they are not. But the point about the book is to warn that unless we change, we're gonna be facing disaster. We've been kicking the can down the road, we've been putting our heads under the sand like oysters, pretending these things don't happen, they don't exist, they don't build up, and things are becoming more fragile. Now, this is a book about the next 10 to 20 years, but literally, each one of these threats is materializing today. If I had time and I don't have time and I'll stop now, I could tell you 10 examples that today in 2022, these threats are occurring for each one of the threats. So it's not a problem about maybe 20 years from now there'll be a problem and maybe we'll have a technology that's gonna resolve every problem. These are things we're facing every day. And our future individually, our own family, our own children is at risk. So you have to start to think about it, worry about it, and start doing something about it. So maybe there is light at the end of the tunnel and it's not the one of the incoming train wreck but the first thing you have to do is to open your eyes, to be aware, think about it, and start discussing what we can do, not just individually. You cannot survive individually. You have to survive collectively, because these are collective threats that have collective solution, not individual solution. And we have to work for a better future, because the alternative will be lucky. My friend uh, Neil Ferguson wrote a piece for Bloomberg just last week. That the title of the book is Why World War III May Be Likely. And he says some of the same things I discussed. He says, we'll be lucky if we end up in the next few years like the 1970s. They were awful. Stagflation, inflation, recession, financial crisis, you name it. He says, we'll be lucky if we end up like in the 1970s. Because given the path we're going right now, we're more likely to repeat what happened in the 1940s, meaning World War II. And if you think about it, we project the future as if it's gonna be the recent past. And luckily for the recent past, we've had 75 years of relative peace, prosperity, and progress. We've all the ups and downs, but relative peace, prosperity, and progress. Billions of people came out of poverty in China and in India and in emerging markets. We didn't have major war between great powers. That did not happen. It was a reasonable economic stability. Many people from very poor became less poor and they became middle class, and some of them became upper income. Billions of people improved a lot in terms of economy, welfare, health, education, opportunities for women, for minorities, and you name it. There's been progress. But, but the kind of threats we're facing are similar to those in the period between 1914 and 1945. Because before these 75 years of peace and progress, we had what, between 1914 in 1945, we had World War One, the Spanish flu, the stock market crash of 1929, the Great Depression, trade war, currency wars, inflation, hyperinflation, deflation, financial meltdowns, the rise of power of extreme authoritarian, militaristic, aggressive regimes, Nazis in Germany, fascists in Italy, Franco in Spain, Japanese authoritarian, and we ended up with World War II and then the Holocaust. And those who are Jewish know about it, and other types of genocide have occurred over time. It was a total period of 30 years of total disaster. And the future may be resembling more those 30 years between 1940 and 1945 than between 45 and the recent time, unless we address this problem. So we can still address them, but believing that everything's gonna be happy, peace, progress, and prosperity may be delusional if we're not realizing that there are serious mega threats we have to address. So I'll close here. Uh, I'll be happy to take a few questions. I spoke a little bit longer than I wanted. But uh, thank you very much for listening to my cheerful message. Thank you. Speak loudly. I have a microphone.